One of the larger problems that you're going to face as a network administrator when it comes to dealing with file servers is how you take all of your spread out resources, all of your different file shares on all your different servers, and get them to the users in a nice, coherent manner. Microsoft has given us what's known as the distributed file system in order to do just this. It used to be that we had one file server and all of our resources were there. The distributed file system, however, deals with the issue that now we have multiple file servers with multiple shares and our users don't know where to look for what. Well, let's take a look at how we're going to combine all of these resources underneath what's known as DFS. The distributed file system refers to a group of technologies that Microsoft first released with Windows 2000 that allows us to take a bunch of different shared folders from different servers and organize them into a logical file system that is not necessarily constrained by a single file server. The beauty of this is that it allows us to set up the file structure however we need it, however our clients expect it to look, without worrying about the way that it's actually structured on the file servers themselves. In Windows Server 2008, DFS is split into two main areas. The first is DFS namespaces, which is what most network administrators are familiar with. This is the service that allows us to go out there and create that logical structure presenting all of the file resources to our users regardless of where they physically are. The second portion of the distributed file system is what's known as DFS replication. DFS replication received a major overhaul with Windows Server 2003 R2 and Microsoft has continued supporting and enhancing this in Windows Server 2008. Let's take a look first at DFS namespaces and how these are going to benefit us as network administrators in making sure that our users can get to the resources that they need. When we first set up a DFS namespace in our environment, what we're going to do is we're going to go into that namespace and add what's known as a DFS folder. This folder is a logical representation of a folder, just like a user would see if they were out browsing the network, that we then target to a remote share. What this means is this logical folder in turn points to a share out on a physical server somewhere in our environment. We can even target a DFS folder at multiple shares on multiple servers. The benefit to this, there's lots of them. One of the big ones is that we can then keep the contents of those folders in sync with DFS replication and users can be redirected to the share that is physically closest to them based on Active Directory site information. So it allows us to give good availability to the information out to our clients. If they're in a branch office, they'll be directed to the server closest to them. They make a change to a file there. That will be replicated to the other targets of that particular DFS folder. Again, the biggest beauty here is that the users don't care what server the resources are physically stored on. Also, if you find that your DFS structure is becoming very, very large, you can get in and create other DFS folders that are simply used to add structure. They don't have targets. They're used to create subfolder structures, if you will, so that you can more logically organize your DFS for all of your clients out there in your network. So with the concept of DFS namespaces, the main thing that you, the network administrator, needs to understand is the type of DFS namespace that you're going to create in your environment. And there's a little bit of planning that has to go in here depending on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Microsoft offers two different types of DFS namespaces. The first is what's known as a standalone namespace. Standalone namespaces use the DFS server name itself as the root of the namespace. What that means is when users are trying to find resources, they would browse out to backslash, backslash server, backslash namespace, backslash whatever the DFS folder is. Why would we do this? Didn't I just talk about one of the big benefits of DFS being the fact that it removed the reliance on the physical server? Well, one of the big reasons that people still look at DFS namespaces as a standalone namespace, utilizing them that way, is because these are the only namespaces that can be set up on a failover cluster. So if you're really looking for high availability and making sure that those resources are always available, especially to a centralized group of users, a failover cluster would be one of the best ways to do that. So combining a failover cluster with DFS, you've got to use a standalone namespace. One word of warning here, this will also impact your planning of which edition of Windows Server 2008 you get. If you're looking at standalone namespaces, the standard edition can only host one standalone namespace per server. Enterprise and data center, they can host unlimited namespaces per server. 
The other type of namespace that we can use is what's known as a domain-based namespace. And these are the ones that most of us are familiar with because this is where we really get into the big benefits of DFS. Imagine the ability to migrate from server to server. You have a file server, an old aging file server that all of your data is stored on and all of your users are mapping to it by name. You're ready to migrate all that data over to another server, but you know what? That new server is going to have a new name. Imagine the pain of having to go through and change all of your scripts, all of your mappings. That's where domain-based namespaces come into play because they use the domain name as the namespace root. In our environment here, we would connect to backslash backslash contoso.com backslash whatever we've named our namespace backslash whatever the DFS folder is. If I move that actual target, remember DFS targets a share on a physical server. If I move that from the old server to the new server, all I've got to do is update the DFS folder to point to the new target. My clients are none the wiser. They don't know that it moved. Another big benefit of domain-based namespaces is the redundancy that they offer because they are stored and managed through Active Directory. This gives me the ability to set up a DFS server in each of my offices, for instance, and have all of them tap into Active Directory to pull out all of the information necessary to provide that DFS structure to my clients. If I have one DFS server go down, does that matter? Well, I probably want to get a backup and running, sure. But no, my clients will connect to another DFS server, and it gives me the redundancy and availability of data that way. Windows Server 2008 also has a lot of other benefits when it comes to domain-based namespaces, but it has a couple of requirements that you've got to meet first. What you've got to do is you've got to be sure that your domain hosting the DFS namespace is in Windows Server 2008 functional mode. You've got to be in that mode for your domain. Also, all of your DFS domain-based namespace servers have to be Windows Server 2008. If you meet those requirements, you can then convert your domain-based namespace from what they call Windows 2000 mode over to Windows Server 2008 mode. That then gives you the ability to utilize access-based enumeration, allowing users to only see those resources that they have permission to see and hiding other resources from their view. It also gives you a big benefit as far as scalability is concerned. This was one of the areas where people would use standalone namespaces because they could scale over 5,000 folders in one namespace. Domain-based namespaces, they couldn't do that. But the Windows Server 2008 mode with domain-based namespaces does allow that type of scalability. So again, further enhancing domain-based namespaces for environments to use. Inside Server Manager, let's take a look at implementing the distributed file system on our Windows Server 2008 system. In the File Services role, I'm going to go ahead and choose Add Role Services. And you'll notice when I turn on the distributed file system, I have two components underneath it, DFS namespaces and DFS replication. You can choose to implement a single service if you want to, although in most cases, you're going to be implementing both of them, which is what I'm going to do here. So I'll select Next. And at this point in time, it takes me into a wizard that allows me to go ahead and create a namespace right from the get-go at this point. So I'll go ahead and enter a name for this. Let's call it the 2008 DFS. I'll choose Next. Which type of a namespace is this going to be? A domain-based namespace or a standalone namespace? And it gives you a preview of what the namespace is going to look like with the domain name and then the namespace root versus the server name and the namespace root. In most scenarios, you're going to want the domain-based namespace, so I'll select Next. And it then gives me the ability right here as I'm setting up DFS to go ahead and add a DFS folder to it. So I'll select Add, and I'm going to go ahead and browse to my folder target. So I'm going to tell it, you know what, show me all of the folders that I've already shared on this system. There's the 2008 share. That one stores a lot of my company's data, so I'll go ahead and pick that. And it then allows me to go ahead and create a name for it. Now, the name that you present through DFS does not have to match the actual share name on the physical system itself. So I can rename this to data if I want, because you know what? A lot of my clients out there are becoming confused as to why they're connecting to a share called 2008. Well, I can rename it data, and then that problem goes away. They no longer ask me that question. I'll select OK and choose Next. It gives me a summary of what it's going to go ahead and do, and I'll select Install. So it's going to install DFS, including both the namespace and the replication services, and at the same time, create a namespace and add a folder and a folder target for me. 
I really like this function of the add role services in Windows Server 2008 because it helps you get everything done at the same time without having to go back and manage and configure everything after the fact. All right, once the installation is completed, go ahead and review to see if there were any errors. Then you can select close, and if you take a look under your file services role, you'll now see that you have the DFS namespace and DFS replication services installed and running. In order to manage these, remember, if you've just installed them, they may not show up under the file services role, so you may have to go ahead and close down the server manager, open it again in order to refresh that. Let's go to my roles now and to file services. And now I've got my DFS management capabilities right here inside my server manager giving me a single console to take care of all of this. All right, well, let's take a look at the namespace that I created. If I double-click on namespaces, it will show me the namespaces that I have on this system. And here's the contoso.com slash 2008 DFS namespace. If I select that namespace to work with, it shows me all of the folders that I have in this particular namespace. Here's my data folder. If I take a look at it, I can see that it is pointing out to 2008 server slash 2008. So there's the folder target. If I wanted to, I could add multiple folder targets in here. Maybe I've got five servers that all store the same information in different buildings on my campus. That way I could have all of the servers participating in DFS, and this one folder would point out to all of those. Clients would then connect to the DFS server that they're closest to. What's the big benefit here? Well, let's take a look at what this gives me. Now, whenever my users are trying to get to resources, I'm going to click on Start Run. Instead of having to remember the server name, let's see, was that on 2008 server, or was that on server B, or was that on the Fred server? They don't have to remember a server name at all anymore. Server names are a thing of the past when it comes to connecting to resources. Instead, they're going to go ahead and connect to the domain, because that doesn't change. They'll connect to the domain, and from there, they'll go ahead and connect to the DFS root. So I'll put in contoso.com slash 2008 DFS. And when I open that, just like browsing out to a file server itself, I see the data folder. That data folder, when I double click it, silently redirects me in the background. So I'm actually connected to the 2008 server. But look at my data path. It still shows me contoso.com 2008 DFS data, even though under the hood, it connected me to 2008 server. This is beautiful from a network administration standpoint because it gives me the ability to move this share from one server to another, and all I've got to do at that point is come in here and change this folder target to the new location. My clients automatically get redirected to the new location. I don't have to change scripts. I don't have to change mappings whatsoever. The other part of the distributed file system is DFS replication. The replication component of DFS allows you to take a folder and keep it synchronized between servers. And we're not talking just two servers here. You can have several servers participating in this DFS replication scheme. The beauty of DFS replication is that it is a multi-master replication engine. What that means is that any folder within the DFS replication realm can have a change happen to a file, and that change will then be replicated out to all of the members of the DFS replication group. What if a change happens to the file on multiple servers at the same time? Well, DFS replication has capabilities built in for that where it keeps the newest one and it puts a copy of the other changes into a special hidden folder that an administrator can get in and work with. The beauty of DFS replication is that you can use it for folders that aren't even shared. So this really adds a lot of flexibility here. If you've got some back-end folders, for instance, that you need to replicate between locations, you can do that with DFS replication. Ironically, that shows you that there are pretty loose ties between DFS replication and DFS namespaces. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation here. Just because you set up a share in DFS does not mean that you have to use DFS replication. And just because you use DFS replication for some folders does not mean that you need to expose those folders inside a DFS namespace. So take that into consideration when you're doing your planning for the resources that you want replicated between all of the servers in your environment. Another thing about Windows Server 2008 that shows you how much work Microsoft has done on DFS replication, it is now the engine that's being used to replicate the sysvol Active Directory volume. 
This is where all of the information for group policies and scripts and things like that is maintained for Active Directory. So Microsoft themselves is using DFS replication to get this information moved around to all of the domain controllers in your environment. The beauty of DFS replication is that it uses a technology that Microsoft has called remote differential compression. This is what other people call delta changes. What it does is it takes a look at a changed file and what it sends across the network are only those bits of the file that have actually changed. So if you've got a 2 meg Word document and you change one word inside that document, it doesn't send the whole thing. No, it actually digs down into that file, finds the bytes that changed, sends those out, and implements that particular change in the file on all of the other copies throughout your environment. So it really saves on bandwidth and makes replicating these files throughout your environment very, very easy and not bandwidth intensive at all. A couple of ideas for DFS replication. Take a look at this when you're planning how to use it. Use it in order to push information out to remote sites. Remember, DFS replication does allow changes to be made in multiple places, and it doesn't work very gracefully if there are collisions in those changes. So Microsoft does not recommend using DFS replication for files that change frequently by multiple people. That would be more of a case for using something like Microsoft Office SharePoint services and checking files out and checking them back in. But if you've got a set of fairly static data that you want to be able to push out, or you've got a set of data that a central group changes and wants to get out to all of the other offices in your environment, that's a wonderful candidate for DFS replication. Set that up so that the users connect to a central share, they make their modifications there to that central location, DFS replication then pushes those changes out to all the other areas. Or how about this, let's go the other way. Instead of pushing data out to remote sites, let's pull data in. Branch offices, a lot of times, might not have their own IT staff. They might not even have somebody who wants to change tapes. So they're often overlooked when it comes to backing up data. Let's use DFS to pull that data in from branch sites to a central location so it can then be backed up. Again, you're not going to be changing the data in both locations. The central office is simply to have a copy of what's done in the branch office. As changes are made in the branch office, that data gets pulled into the central office so it can be included in your nightly backups. One of the basic ways that you're going to work with DFS replication inside the DFS management console is by taking a look at different folder targets for one DFS folder. So for instance, I've got my data DFS folder. It currently is pointed to server 2008. If I had two or three other servers in here, I'd want to be sure that all of the data inside all of these folder targets matched. Well, the beauty of that is I could come over to the Replication tab, and it would allow me to go ahead and start the Replicate Folder Wizard to go ahead and set up replication for all of those different folders underneath this one DFS folder itself. That way, it would keep the contents of the folders in sync. Any user who connected to any of those, who was referred to any of those folder targets, would see the exact same data. The other way that you can set up DFS replication is by coming down under DFS Management into DFS Replication, and creating a new replication group. Replication groups are collections of servers and folders that are going to replicate data with each other. One of the things that I really like about the new replication group wizard that comes up here is it allows you to choose what type of replication you want to set up. So right from the get-go, you can set up a replication group for data collection. This allows you to set up information flow, for instance, from a branch office to a hub server. That's the example that they're using here that allows you to collect that information from one location and bring it in. There's really nothing special about doing it this way except for the initial direction of the replication. By choosing this replication group for data collection, what's going to happen is the wizard will go ahead and say, OK, where's your source? Where's your destination? And it will then allow me to replicate my initial time from the source to the destination. From that point forward, it shifts to the normal multi-master replication, which means a change made in either location is going to go ahead and be replicated out to the other locations. So as you can see, from a planning standpoint, this wizard works really well. Microsoft walks you through picking the branch server, the hub server, as well as setting up different items such as a schedule and how much bandwidth to use, which is directly targeted at backing up data. The other wizard that you could run, the multi-purpose wizard, simply allows you to go through and choose your source, your destination, add all the different servers and groups in to the replication group so that the information will be replicated back and forth. 
once the replication kicks in, it is then multi-master. It's not a one-way replication. So bear that in mind as you're going through and working with DFS replication. Overall, the DFS replication technology is a wonderful addition to your toolbox as an IT administrator for a large enterprise organization. It gives you the ability to keep files in sync across multiple servers throughout your environment. Couple that together with DFS namespaces and now you can give your users the ability to get to the files that they need in a coherent file structure that actually makes sense to them.